Hello, everyone. Uh, we are approaching the start of our webinar. Welcome. It's good to see some of the names we've already seen in many different uh, webinars in our Telegram channel and in our applicant pool. Hopefully, um, you will be joining us soon as students. So it's wonderful that you decided to attend this webinar. Um, I am today hiding behind a photo because uh, I'm just here to answer questions. While Professor Zaitsev is holding the webinar, I will be answering any questions you may have. So please feel free and uh, don't be shy to ask anything you want to ask about the program, about statistics and data analytics in general, or about the work that we do. I will be delighted to answer. And um, just a minute before we start, um, I just, it became a tradition, I think, to talk about weather um, before the start of our webinars. Mm -hmm. Moscow has survived a major storm uh, where the streets were flooded and the metro was flooded and lots of parts of Moscow region were left without power or any kind of connection. We haven't had a storm like that in a very, very long time. So we had record high temperatures and then we had a record storm. So um, that's the news from Moscow. So where are you guys from and what's going on in your part of the world? Please feel free to share with us. Okay, here's a question. Do we have scholarship or support options available for the course? So as you know, we have two programs. Um, we have a program that's online only, and that is Coursera, program called Master of Data and Network Analytics. Um, this program offers um, discounts or scholarships, if that's what you want to call it, based on your country of residence. So it doesn't matter um, what your academic standing is, um, it only matters where you live. And this is a Coursera-wide um, approach to supporting education worldwide. So please contact us and let us know what your country is and we will let you know what your discount is. Now we also have an offline program and that's a program that's being offered in our campus in Moscow. That program does not offer scholarships based on your country of origin, but it does offer scholarships based on academic merit. So it does not matter where you're from, some of the best students, some of the best applicants will again receive up to a 50% discount from their tuition. So both programs offer a 50% discount, but based on completely different criteria. And I think that has taken us to 1901. So it is time to start. I think um, out of respect for everyone who is here on time, again, welcome everyone. It's a delight to see some of our old friends here that we've seen a few times before and know well from the application process. And also to welcome some new faces that we have not seen before. Uh, my name is Valentina Koskova. I am an academic supervisor of the Master of Data and Network Analytics program offered on Coursera platform. Today, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to an academic supervisor of our offline program, Professor Dmitry Zaitsev, who has gone full circle and actually completed the path that many of you aspire to complete. Being an associate professor already and having worked in academia for quite a few years, he decided that he wanted to jump on that bandwagon of data analytics and join the world in making sense of data using state-of-the-art tools in data analysis. So he entered, he enrolled uh, in our master's program, Applied Statistics with Network Analysis, that's our offline program, and successfully finished at cum laude and um, being a PhD already and being a professor. So um, I think that's a great inspiration to many of us and many of our colleagues at HEC, at our lab and outside. 
And today, uh, Professor Zaitsev will share with you his journey on analyzing data. He started as a qualitative researcher, and now he's doing some impressive analysis using state-of-the-art techniques. So he will share his journey with you, and he will talk to you about a very important variable in analysis, actually, no matter where you are, uh, called effectiveness. So we can talk about personal effectiveness, we can talk about organizational effectiveness, we can talk about many different types of effectiveness. It's an amazing word because everyone understands what it means, yet everyone understands it differently. Yet today we made a promise that we'll share with you a tool that allows you to analyze effectiveness no matter how you define it. So this is a very good example of what we teach in our program. We teach you to define the concept that you're measuring, select the data that you will use to analyze your concept, and then analyze it. So without any further ado, I am turning the floor over to Professor Dmitry Zaitsev, again, Academic Supervisor of Master's Program Applied Statistics with Network Analysis, of which he's a former graduate, um, also a senior researcher at our international laboratory, and um, our today's webinar speaker. Professor Zaitsev, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kuskova. And uh, indeed, I will talk today about effectiveness and uh, share with you some very great tool to analyze effectiveness in social sciences and in business analytics. But uh, first, let me again introduce myself um, because I think uh, I can share with you not only with their uh, my reflection about effectiveness and uh, the data development analysis that is a method and the software to study effectiveness. But also, I think it will be interesting to share with my personal experience how it comes that I came from um, such uh, mostly qualitative, at least in Russia, as a political science to uh, applied data analysis. As uh, Professor Kusko already said, I got my PhD in 2009 with dissertational think tanks as actors of political process. And uh, then uh, I was uh, working for several years in public policy department and then at the International Laboratory for Applied Network Research. And my original education is in political science. I have master in political science with some experience in public policy. But uh, after 10 years of uh, when I got my PhD, I decided to become student again. And uh, now I have my master on applied mathematics and informatics. So it is uh, MASNA, we call this Master of Applied Statistics and Network Analysis, the offline program and the, the MDNA Master of Data and Network Analytics is a mirror of this master program. Also, I have experience of working in contract think tanks specialized on applied sociology called Circon Research Group and um, was the head of several education projects at HEC, public policy department, and now I'm just from 1st of July, I believe, I will be an academic supervisor of MASNA. Uh, with this, uh, it's important, this background is also important because I want to refer you to the um, two weeks ago webinar of Professor Kuskova uh, where she asked question, what makes you unique? And uh, I want to answer for myself that uh, this path from the political science combined with public policy and interest in applied statistics, mathematics, and data analysis with some experience working for commercial projects created for me this double professional identity that I want to develop that is computational political scientist that uh, I'm still 
consider myself as a political scientist, but I want to uh, move into the computational aspects, testing theories of political science with computational tools of data analytics. There also my interest in public policy combined with the network analytics give this uh, another, I think, unique uh, specialization in policy network scientists. So it's sort of double identity, but what united is the interest uh, in the analysis of complexity, of complex system and processes. Um, and uh, I think that uh, here, social sciences like sociology and political science and even in business analytics we underestimate the importance of complexity and the complex system and processes why it's so i'll try to explain and why i think it's important and how it connected with the effectiveness i will try to elaborate a little bit so why studying complex systems and processes so I want to refer you to your famous um, story of Tolkien, Lord of the Ring. And if you remember the wizard, Galadriel, yeah, she said that the world is changed. Yeah? So the world is changed indeed, and the world became complex. And it's, it's getting more and more complicated each day. And if you want to be successful, either in the sciences or in business, you have to understand that this world is very complex and there are a lot of factors that influence on each other. There are a lot of factors that influence on the success of these actors and so on. And this world will never be simple again. Okay, if we consider this world as complicated, what does it mean? It means that we need complicated advanced methods of data analysis to study this world, to understand this world, to live in this world. And um, this is, uh, uh, this understanding came to me as Professor Kuskov already said, while I was more qualitative political scientist. And this is the example of one of my qualitative research it was conducted before I was fully involved in this data analytics stuff and applied statistics stuff. We, uh, and the first, my initial interest in science, uh, I was interested in the role of policy analysts or intellectuals in politics. I was mostly uh, uh, empowered by your famous, if you might know, the Plato book, uh, where he said that the intellectuals have to run government, have to govern people. Why? Because they are smart. That is why intellectuals have to govern. Uh, and with this idea, I decided to study think tanks, intellectuals, and the policy analysts and their role in policy making. Yeah. And one of the projects was to study different Russian regions. Here we have Republic of Karelia, Republic of Tatarstan and Saratov region. And what is the role of intellectuals there? Uh, for non-Russian audience, I will say that uh, we have a lot of regions in Russia and they are very different, very diverse from the economic, political, social background. Some of them are more democratic, some of them are uh, less democratic more developed economically, less developed and so on. And uh, it seems was was interesting to study uh, how do policy analysts influence on policy making in these regions. And when we came to this region, they said to us that they do not have any influence on policy making, like healthcare, migration policy, education policy. And we was very doubt in this that in such different regions uh, their influence or the experts will be the same and indeed when we start digging we understand that there is difference and very important difference between Karelia where the 
experts have a great influence on economic program development, policy development, um, policy change, and Tatarstan, for example, where the analyst is totally under the control of the government, and Saratov region in between. And uh, the question is why? And it's happened that if you want to understand, for example, the influence or the um, power of expert community on policy making, you have to consider a very complicated picture. You have to consider the infrastructure in the region, the political situation in the re region, the culture that uh, this region and the people in um, Sarat, Kareli, Tatarstan had, and the, and the identity of these people. And all these unique factors and actors interact in, into the unique picture for each region that make uh, uh, different uh, how do they influence on policy making. So this uh, understanding can be generalized. And this is only one example of my projects where I understand that the theories that we have in political science and social sciences uh, are simpler than the real world is. So, uh, and um, to generalize it, I think that there are three ways in social sciences and even uh, in applied research too. So either you, the two of them are uh, classical and uh, we know them, yeah? So either you theory builders and you decided to devote your life to develop some new theories or develop old theories, add something to them and uh, you become mostly qualit qualitative guy or you decided to become a quantitative uh, guy and uh, not to develop a new theory, but to test the old one using different empirical methods like regression, for example. Yeah, And regression still is the most popular method in political science, for example. And there is a great division between these two camps, like empiricists and theoreticians, you can say so. And usually, uh, theoreticians said to the empiricists that, look, you do not have any novelty, only we have novelty. Yeah, so you prove the old theories that we already know. And empiricists said, no, oh, look, you develop some theories, but you cannot tell to us, are they true or not? Because only uh, using quantitative methods, with use of quantitative methods, we can prove uh, some theory, we can find some evidence to this theory. So, and this is the um, old competition between two. Um, I was not satisfied with any of this camp. I don't want to be empiricist. I don't want be, to be a theorist. And I decided that I have to combine these two things. So why I cannot develop some new theory and test it? or take the old theory and test it with some complicated methods. And if so, if you choose this third way that I, we call pioneers or explorers, if so, you need new methods, you need advanced methods of data analysis. If you want to combine both. So, and uh, this, came to the idea of the third way in social science and applied research too, because if you decided to become a business analyst, you will faced with some business problem and you can see the complexity of the problem. And the more complexity in the problem you will see, the more effective you will be in solving this problem. So this third way is of pioneers or explorers is to study phenomena without reduction of their complexity. And to do so, you need complicated advanced statistical methods like network analysis or other relational 
methods like data development analysis that I will introduce today, or structural equation modeling, and others that provide you a tool without reduction of complexity to understand social phenomena. And it seems, and it find that we find out that the core research focus, if we will put it in this third way, will be the effectiveness. So, uh, and if you will think about this, and that even in business or inside science, we are talking about, either we are talking about organization or government or about a person, we will talk about effectiveness. So effectiveness is everywhere. And in very diverse sciences, we face with the problem of effectiveness. Either it is management, economics, political science, or psychology. This is the idea. Uh, of course, effectiveness came from the management and from the organizational sciences. And uh, this simple example, how do uh, management, management and organizational sciences approach to the problem of effectiveness, again, prove that we are talking about a uh, very complicated, complex system and process. Yeah, if we are go go talking about organization performance, about effectiveness of organization, we have to take into account external environment, very different, including the cultural environment, organizational capacity, very different thing of organizational capacity and organizational motivation. So again, the picture become very complicated. So if it is complicated, we cannot reduce it to a simple model with one Y, one X, yeah? So it have to be complicated. More complexity even uh, can be added uh, if you will trace uh, effectiveness from the management, the difference between efficiency and effectiveness. Um, it depends what is your focus. If you are talking about the resources and how to minimize with minimal resources reach some result, it will be efficiency. If you are talking about effectiveness, we put in the focus, first of all, the result. And sometimes it doesn't matter how you deliver this result. Yeah, Russians can remember the Bolsheviks slogan that the results is good uh, despite of any means. Yeah, so it's effectiveness. Then we can have, we will reach theoretically into four theoretical uh, models. Yeah, and we, Pursuing right goals, so we are effective, but we're inefficient because costs are high. Costs are high. Like, for example, Bolsheviks. But Bolsheviks, we know they did not reach their goals with communists, but never, never mind. Another thing is that we can be efficient, so uh, we, pro we produce something with low cost, but we uh, reach wrong goals. Yes, of course, we can have a situation of inefficient and ineffective when we pursue the wrong goals and uh, very, with very expensive cost. And we can be there, uh, the best situation when we're both effective and efficient. When we pursue the right goals um, with low cost. Yeah? So this is a general reflection. Uh, on the effectiveness and what is the difference between efficiency and effectiveness. And um, uh, we can continue the theoretical exploration of what is effectiveness. Um, and uh, in our lab, we have uh, several projects on effectiveness. Uh, also in English, we have the, another world that's called efficacy. So it's very interesting theoretical endeavor but the point is that it is complicated. Yeah, it's a complicated problem that need a complicated, complex methods of analysis. And in this brief 
uh, webinar, I will uh, also add something about data development analysis. That is the tool or method uh, that allow you to study both effectiveness and efficiency and without the reduction of the complexity. So what is data development analysis? Uh, it is linear programming method for efficient simulation. Uh, what is interesting is that it can uh, it analyze the so-called decision-making units. Uh, decision-making units can be anything. It's just a sort of slang yeah, for this method. It can be anything from company organizations to, for example, countries. So we can study efficiency of countries, for example, for fighting with COVID. Yeah. Um, but originally it was created to study efficiency of organizations. Um, and what is important, it evaluates efficiency of these demo decision-making units relative to each other. Yeah? And um, you need inputs and outputs. It's another um, words, specific words. You can think uh, about inputs and outputs in the way of like we think about regression, uh, like dependent and independent variables. Uh, but what is unique and what is maybe not unique, but what is good for data development analysis that make it differ from the simple simple methods is that you can have as much outputs as you want. So you can have as much Ys as you want that again, give us an opportunity to study the complexity of real life problems without reduction of this complexity. Of course, you can uh, look into the longitudinal changes of efficiency over time. Uh, it is non-parametric uh, method, data development analysis, uh, which uh, make it differ from the traditional parametric methods uh, which share the common assumption of IID, independent identically distributed variables. So we do not need here the IID assumption. That is good because where in the real life uh, problems you can find IID variables, nowhere. Uh, also, it can deal with the data of all types. Of course, it cannot deal with nominal measured variables, but interval or ratio level, uh, it's okay. That's also a great advantage of this method. A large number of not only inputs, but also outputs, but a, in, a lot of inputs is also advantages, yeah, because we know that because of multicollinearity in the near regression, so it's not a, a it, it's a problem to uh, input a lot of uh, independent variables. And they have to be independent. Yeah. Uh, so it overcomes many limitations of traditional statistical methods. So it's great. Uh, what is the uh, general idea of data development analysis so that you have key objects? Again, we, they call them decision-making units that compare with each other. It can be organization, it can be countries. It can be universities, whatever you want to compare. Uh, so why decision-making units? Because they decide how to uh, spend their resources to reach some goals. That is why they, they decide, they're decision-making units. Uh, it can be government, it can be political parties, it can be non-governmental organizations that uh, share their resources, spend their resources and so on. Each uh, of uh, these decision-making units has multiple indices, but the most important are the inputs or they call it resources. So some organizations spend resources or inputs to reach some results or outputs. For example, you have a company uh, which want to increase their sales and uh, this will be the outputs. And resources can be the spendings for their advertising, for example, for different kinds of advertising. This can, this can be, will be inputs. 
And uh, the method is trying to maximize uh, outputs, for example. So uh, like also, actually it's in, in, written in the formula. Yeah? So it's tried to, for example, maximize outputs uh, um, to understand, is it enough resources that the organization have to reach the maximum result compared with the other units? This is, I tried to explain the output oriented model, but also it can be input oriented model that uh, is trying to solve this optimization problem in a little bit another way, trying to understand what is the, will be the minimum resources to reach the current result. And uh, this formula is very simple, actually, because we have uh, outputs, we have inputs, and uh, then uh, the program, usually we use programs, yeah, software, uh, try to um, develop some weights that will be uh, the optimal solution for each decision-making units. Yeah? Optimal meaning that either you optimize, uh, maximize uh, results, or you minimize resources that are used to reach this result. In another way, to say it in another words, words we have vector of access or inputs. Uh, we have some processing inside, and then we have outputs that is our wires. Yeah. So a lot of facts. Not only many access we can have as an inputs or resources or our variables to study, but also we have a lot of wires. That is the beauty of this method, one of the beauty of this method. I already said that decision-making units is the key, is a core concept for this method, and it can be anything. Department, for example, in the university, can be models of car, can be companies, organizations, countries. I'm always said about countries because one of the project is to study the efficiency of effectiveness of sanctions, for example, and uh, their decision-making units are countries, or effectiveness of protests, if it can be, if they can be effective. Um, what is good reference that you can obtain data on? Yeah? Inputs can be any variables, again, internal or external, for very different things. It depends on the subject of your study. And outputs is some, some uh, measures of performance of the decision-making units. Um, aha, another important uh, concept is the frontier. As data development analysis is non-parametric method, means that uh, you are not limited with your normal distribution, for example, that is always a background for the traditional parametric methods. Uh, but here you have to have some theoretical understanding about the frontier or the return to scale. Yeah? What do I mean? I mean that you have to choose uh, how, how do the, your x and y's are related. If you choose, for example, CRS, it's constant return to scale frontier, you presume that the each unit, the increase of your access in each unit will increase uh, your Y proportion in the same proportion. For example, here we increase in one unit and the Ys will increase in one unit. Increasing two, he increased it to, and so on. You see, it's a, a, a straight uh, line here. Yeah. So it's constant return to scale. And the more you increase it, you will have the same proportionate increase in your lines. In other, but it's not the case. And especially social scientists know this uh, uh, for sure that there are a lot of social processes when at some point you can see that the increase of your efforts, for example, in one unit, will not lead to the increase of the outcome in one unit. It will lead to a 
small increase or it can even have the uh, contrary result yeah for example when we are talking about uh, the repressive mechanism of the government for example you know, if you press and press uh, and increase the pressure to your citizens uh, at some point it can lead to the contrary results so that is why we need different frontiers for example uh, another interesting frontier is verbal return to scale when uh, at some point, the increase in the one unit will lead to the less increase in your vice. And for example, if you choose non increasing the total scale frontier, it will be even have a different effect here. It's not very clearly seen here, but uh, from some point, uh, you will lead to the contrary result or the decrease of your results. Yeah. So, um, what also is important about these frontiers that this method is built in a way that it's um, search for such weights for your inputs and outputs, x and y's, that the efficient uh, decision making units, countries, organizations that spend their resources efficiently compared with others, they appear to be on their frontier, like uh decision making units one and decision making units three here so they are situated live in this frontier directly and they will be efficient inefficient compared to them will be on the frontier and it doesn't mean what kind of uh type of frontier you will choose efficient will be on it inefficient will be under it that is why they call data envelopment analysis so this frontier is a sort of envelopment yeah, for this decision envelope uh, for this decision uh, making units and uh, model results so we have as a result of this uh, analysis we have a lot of interesting information to interpret one of the core thing is efficiency and uh, again here we use this word efficiency uh leading uh, following the tradition mostly because in data development analysis everything is efficiency but again if you choose output oriented model that is uh answering the question uh, about what can be the maximal result uh, having these resources it will be actually effectiveness yeah if we are a minimized input oriented model if you mi mi minimize resources it will be efficiency but in here we call it uh, in the same way so efficiency scores is a first output that we receive uh, from the model and uh, the scores of this efficiency is um, can be uh, differ from zero to one or from zero to 0% to 100% and 100% uh, indicate efficient units. So this is exact, those units that are situated on the frontier will receive 100% efficiency. So it means that depend on the model that you choose, if you choose output oriented model, it means that they use the resources effective uh, to maximum and they have maximum, maximal result uh with the resources that they have yeah if this score is under 100 percent or one it depends on how you will scale it either the inputs are not fully utilized given the outcome and could potentially generate a great outcome or the outcome needs to be augmented output based model so again it depends on the model that you choose also more results you have from data development analysis weights and slacks weights is theoretically it is um, this uh, numbers uh, with which data is manipulated to calculate uh, the efficiency score 
but the practical meaning is that uh, <clears throat> the resources that receive a high weight, more than zero actually, they are used for the decision-making units to, the, to reach the result that we observe. Slacks is the indicator of excessive inputs, uh, missing outputs, of course, but uh, if you get <clears throat> a high slack, it means that actually more than zero. It mean, mean that uh, this inputs is excessive. It's just uh, no use of this resource. We will have more. <clears throat> we'll have more clarity when we come to the example. Also, we will get improvements. So it's another benefit of this model because uh, you will not only receive information about what kind of resources. Um, are used by the company to reach a certain level of efficiency, but also you will uh, grab information about uh, how, to what extent you can improve your efficiency and uh, to what extent you have to decrease or increase your resources to reach their uh, uh, ex ex expected level of efficiency. Peer groups, also important, uh, result of the data uh, because here as it is relative method so you compare decision making units with each other uh, we get information about uh, the our peers or referent decision making units so what are the uh, company that can be example for us to reach the desired level of efficiency. Cross efficiency, this is another result, also very interesting. You will see, the, uh, I think it will be better to, to explain it and we'll see the case, concrete case. So this is important slide because here in one slide we have the uh, roadmap, what we can do and what kind of results from data development analysis we can get. So as usual in any methods, we start with variable selection and beauty of this method again that you have, you can have a lot of not only access but also wise. Choice of return to scale. So you can also control, uh, theoretically control on the, what kind of uh, distribution you have. And you uh, generate in the end efficiency weights like improvements, peers, cross efficiency, cross efficiency, and also you can have a look into the dynamic. How do the efficiency change in time? Um, let's go to the case study that we have. One of the case study of using data development analysis, and it will get more clear. What do we mean in theory? So the, the case study I want to share today is about the efficiency of marketing strategy. It is real life projects that we conducted for one of the big auto, automobile corporation, transnational corporation. And um, the problem, the real life problem was that the auto industry producer company, transnational company actually, needs to understand the efficiency of its marketing strategy marketing campaign yeah so we get we get uh, data about 17 cars brands from different automakers uh for each brand there were marketing expenses associated with several advertising channels so it's some spendings for tv advertising spending for advertising for radio digital advertising and so so we have spendings in uh rubbles i think uh, for each brand there is a total number of cars sold so sales is our output or resulting variable and the task was to relate marketing efficiency of each car brand so what is the most efficient car brand strategy marketing strategy what is the less and so on well, of course one of this brand was our client and he was concerned about she it it was concerned about um were all their marketing campaigns efficient or not and uh, against other competitors yeah. uh, 
um, several problems, several questions. Uh, marketing that was our client was concerned. Uh, marketing spending is substantial. Can it be reduced or not? So all these com companies um, are interesting in uh, reduction of the spendings and can they reduce spendings without any damage to the result, to the sales, to the money? Um, there was special interest in digital advertising. Is it the best marketing channel? Uh, is it always so or not? Uh, the third question is about the competitors with similar spending, but maybe they have bad results. Yeah, maybe they do something uh, else that can, uh, with the same spendings, can increase the results. Uh, and what determines uh, competitors' efficiency? Uh, this is one of the result and as you remember we are start with the efficiency scores we have two points in time 2017 2018 17 brands and you see that the program provide us the result in percents in in this case so from actually theoretical zero to 100 percent and the efficient brands efficient brands have 100% yeah, efficiency. So it means that they spend uh, resources for advertising efficiently in a way that the sales, the sales are maximum. It was output oriented model. You can see that car brand number one, two, four, five was efficient in both periods of time, as well as 11, 13, 14, and so on. Yeah? So this is how you interpret data. Uh, this is, I do not see the um, title, but I guess it's weights. You, can, you have to see it. It weights and um, it is weights. Um, the next result, it means that uh, what kind of resources, or in our case, it is spendings for the advertising, are really useful, uh, are used and useful to reach the maximum level of sales. And uh, we can uh, analyze it by brands, but we also can have a general picture and we can say, for example, that the spendings for the uh, original TV advertising is used by the majority of brands, by 16 brands out of 17 and only for car number three, it is not important to reach the maximum level of uh, sales and car number three i think is not efficient in 2008 so uh next is slacks slacks it means that what kind of resources are useless yeah so oh, I, uh, too much uh, used by the year uh in our case by brands and here we can see that uh, that uh, here, as we can guess, that TV original TV spendings, for example, is uh, useless for car number three. Yeah? It is not used according to the weights for to maximize the sales, and it is current spendings are useless. Yeah? So, and uh, the most and the digital, by the way, if you remember the, 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 the one of the uh, questions of our client, client uh, digital spendings for digital advertising is not so important yeah? for many brands, for nine brands to reach the maximum level of sales. That was a, quite a surprise actually for our client too. Uh, national TV also, we, we can say it without research, that national no, political scientists can say that in Russia. Uh, so uh, the next uh, outcome that we can get from the there is the improvements, some uh, softwares called the targets. So it provides us with information, yeah, another useful information that other methods uh, maybe uh, are hard to uh, 
have some uh, difficulties to deliver uh, this kind of information, but in any BS software, you can do it, uh, receive this information automatically, any good software. Uh, it means that uh, to what extent you can increase or in our case, decrease the spendings for the advertising to increase the levels of sales. In our case, we are here, we first of all are interesting in inefficient cases. And for inefficient cases or brands, this uh, here we will be positive numbers, meaning that to what extent they can increase their sales. So for example, for car number three, that we remember that is inefficient, you can decrease uh, the sales in uh, more than 19, whatever it is, troubles, millions, something. Um, if you decrease spending on digital in this sum, press in this sum, so you see that it's inefficient indeed. So they spend a lot of money for advertising uh, and reach the not efficient results. So they can just cut the spendings and uh, they will increase the sales. Yeah, Maybe to uh, put this money to something else. Uh, yeah, the influence has got variable. Something else uh, to save this money and it will increase sales. Yeah. Uh, what next? Also, we have information about the peers. So it provides us information uh, for each pair of cars uh, for inefficient cars or for inefficient decision-making units. What are the peers? What are the exemplary brands uh, that have this similar profile of resources but they are more efficient or uh, effective than we are vis a -vis, yeah? So, and uh, this is the perfect situation when we can build a network because we have actually, we have a, a squared matrix here on the picture, uh, two uh, columns are missed. Uh, but it's a 17 by 17 matrix, and you can build um, actually the, a network from this. And here it is. And uh, for example, let's go again to the car number three, brand number three. And you see that it is inefficient. It means that it will be a directed graph. So there will be a link from car one to, in our case, to car one from car three to car one, from car three to car 15. And these two uh, brands are exemplary, appears for the year brand number three. Means that if brand number three wants to have more efficient results with the sales, it have to look, uh, pay special attention to the marketing strategy of these two brands, number one and 15. Of course, behind these numbers, we have actual brands, but we cannot show it um, because of NDA. And here is the next example of cross efficiency. Yeah. So here we have much more information. We don't only have the information about uh, the peers, but also we have information about to what extent um, the efficiency of inefficient brands can increase if they will they will use the resources of their peers and other brands too. You remember car free have to look, pay special attention to the marketing strategy of car number one and car number 15. You see, if you'll compare numbers, here is 90, if car number three will get the resources of car number 15, it will reach the year uh, 95 percent of efficiency current is 83.6 and if they will look into the example of car number it will be 99.9 .9, so almost 
100%. So you can see that for car number three, brand number one is better peer. Yeah? This kind of information we can grab from the cross efficiency metrics. And again, uh, we can build networks and we like build networks because we are programs about network analytics. And um, you will learn more about how to deal with these networks if you will enroll in our program. And uh, so what about our questions? So we answer our questions. Can it be reduced for a lot of car brands, it can be reduced because the spendings for the advertising is inefficient compared with the competitors. What about digital advertising? Is it always the best marketing channel? No, in fact, it is the most inefficient channel. And it was an interesting surprise for our client. Are there any competitors with similar spendings? Yes, and we understand the production function. So we understand the profile of the resources and the spendings. And um, what determines competitor's efficiency, the story of one unique channel. Yeah. So we get some answers with the use of data and development analysis. So coming to the end, so how you personally can try this data development analysis software, first, uh, point first thesis is that actually um, all important major software like R, Stat, or SAS have their uh, library option to make to create the model with their, their data development analysis, but the problem is that they are not perfect. And um, the better the better software we, you can find in the internet actually uh, but the main disadvantages of the softwares that we have that they are paid based so you have to pay for this this is not an advertising um, yeah for 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 this um, but uh, this is the uh, matter of fact so one of the link is one of one of the possible uh, software that you can find just if you will Google their software. But uh, also in R, we have uh, several libraries that deal with DR, that is benchmarking and the multiplier there for cost efficiency. Uh, and others, I believe, um, that you can use. Uh, they are not uh, very much different from what we have in status. As. And of course, we have Excel where we can do it. And there are a lot of open source uh, Excel based software that uh, provide the opportunity to calculate uh, your model using that. Uh, and uh, I will not show you today the R code, uh, but because actually uh, on our Coursera specialization that called Network Analytics for Business, this is a specialization of our master program, Master of Data and Network Analytics. Here is the link. We have a course, Business Analytics, Diversity of Practical Applications. And within this course, week two is about performance evaluation with a very detailed explanation of data development analysis, fear of effectiveness and efficiency with our exploration of building this model in R with code. So if you interesting in this uh, method and if you want to have some immediately practical tool, uh, coding tool, I just refer you to this um, uh, lecture and uh, you can try with your own data to create a data development analysis model. Um, this is it. If you have any questions, you can contact uh, and write to us to mdna at hsc.ru or to use our Telegram channels that we have at our program. And I believe that uh, Anna Sokol, Gregory Hladsky already uh, just provided a link to our channels. Yes, I'm. Um, yes, here is the chat 
uh, you can find our Telegram. Telegram chat. And also, I think we can invite you on the next webinar on July 6th. And here's a link. Please register, you're welcome. This next webinar, we're going to talk about your careers and what you can do with data analytics in today's world and how data analytics is different from data science or is it different from data science and um, the important skills that you want to have in order to be the most competitive in today's very highly competitive analytics market. So that would be on um, July 6th. I would love to thank um, Professor Zaitsev for this presentation. And um, yes, please write to us, um, join our Telegram chat, um, check, check out our social media channels. I think we have every channel out there, including TikTok. So join us and hang out with us. Even if you don't join our program, maybe there will be something that we can share with you that you will find useful for your future career. Thank you for spending your evening with us or day, wherever you might be. I mean, if you're in the States, it's certainly very early, still in the day, days ahead. And uh, we'll see you very soon in about a week. Thank you everyone for being with us. Please ask questions if you have any. Then see you next week. Yes, it's actually thank, eight o'clock for the timing, Professor Zaitz, of exactly an hour. Yeah, or oh, I do not, not look at the <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yes, thank you and goodbye, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Have a good day. Goodbye.